All right, I'm happy with that. So we'll get started uh, and and let the rest of the folks trickle in. So again, uh, welcome, thank you for joining us today. I'm actually going to start out by asking y'all a question. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen. Please take a moment to fill this out. So just one to five, how willing are you to incorporate stories uh, and anecdotes into your communication? So I'll leave this up for a little bit, let folks answer. All right, give you all a few more seconds. All right, so let's see. Oh, great, all right, so this is good. You're in the right place. Uh, this is what we're gonna talk about is incorporating stories into your communication, and specifically incorporating the personal into your communication. Housekeeping things before we start, uh, there is a questions uh, drop down box, whatever in your little widget, ask questions. Uh, one of us will be monitoring these, we will get to questions throughout. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then uh, we will uh, we'll address those as many as we can at the end. We very much encourage your participation. So briefly, and again, if you've attended one of our webinars before, I apologize, but a little bit about us, if you haven't. We are part of uh, the American Geophysical Union, Big Earth and Space Science Society, lots of journals, conferences, et cetera. Within AGU is what we do. We're in the Sharing Science Program. So we are scientists who help other scientists communicate their science uh, through stories and other means. And we do this through a whole slew of different ways you're in one of them right, right now. So we do these webinars. We have a robust webinar series we'll talk about in a second. But we also do more personalized things like workshops. We have a bunch of online resources. We're on social media. So check us out uh, if you haven't already. This is the third in this kind of mini series we're doing on storytelling basics. If you missed the first two, uh, or any of them, we will be providing follow-up information and links onto where to access uh, recordings, uh, infographics, all that type of thing. And then we have a schedule for the rest of our webinars in the storytelling season, yeah, for the rest of the year that we'll uh, talk about at the end. Briefly about us, so like I said, my name's Shane. I am an ecologist by training. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into myself because I have a story actually, uh, but just to say that now in the role I am in uh, at AGU, um, science communication trainer, but I also do a lot of storytelling and storytelling training through AGU and other outlets. Olivia? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, so yes, I'm Olivia. I am also a biologist by training, as you'll probably figure out by the kinds of examples that I'm going to be giving during the, the rest of the day. Uh, and I do storytelling here as part of my work, storytelling workshopping, and also do a lot of story writing uh, in my own time. Thanks, Olivia. So if you missed uh, the first two webinars in this series, that's okay. You don't need them to for this one. But just to um, just to recap very quickly. So I'm gonna actually gonna do a quick story in a second, but what you missed, uh, or just as a quick refresher, so storytelling is everywhere. Storytelling is a type of uh, language, it's a type of communication, everything we know has been passed down through stories, all history, and storytelling is uh, not just a thing that we in uh, the States or in the West have just come up with, like, oh, we've just now invented storytelling and storytelling and science. Like, no, absolutely not. There are entire cultures that have not only been telling stories 
for as long as um, communication has been a thing, but storytelling and science has been this interconnected uh, device and or it's they, there is no kind of separation like science storytelling. So I just wanna be mindful of that, that we're gonna talk about stories as a way to communicate science, but by no means have is this a new idea to us or to many of the people, places, organizations that are doing it. We talk about storytelling because there's biological reasons why we tell stories. We connect on a neurological level when we tell stories. So there's a lot of science to back up storytelling, why we should use it. And we do get into that in this webinar. And so the first webinar was about the story structure. This is your basic story arc. We'll keep coming back to this, but all stories have a certain structure and they follow, they can follow a certain set of uh, uh, like a certain pattern or a certain set of rules. Rules are always meant to be broken, but if you're looking for a place to start, this is a good way of thinking about the structure of a story, this basic story arc. And then our second webinar was all about narrative themes. There are a bajillion narrative themes. This is a small sampling of perhaps some of the more popular ones, but stories, science or otherwise, can fall into and do fall into these different narrative themes. So thinking about stories as narrative themes um, can be really helpful. So I just, that's a really quick overview or a really quick recap that's by design because we're not here to talk about what we've already talked about. We're here to talk about stories. And so I'm gonna start off with a personal story. So growing up, uh, I wanted to be a teacher or a scientist or an engineer or maybe an architect, basically anything that had to do with science or math, but definitely not English. Uh, there's a saying in my family, Hamlins don't do English, which in this moment, right this very second, I understand uh, the, say, irony in that. But I ended up going to a university not far from where I grew up in rural Pennsylvania to be a science teacher. I thought this would be a great way to kind of check a bunch of boxes. And about halfway through my undergraduate, I was doing research for a graduate student um, and his office was in the oldest, most decrepit building in the basement. He drove a car that was six different colors with a thousand different parts from different vehicles. He was overworked, he was underpaid. And I realized that I wanted that life. I did, I wanted it. I wanted to be this guy. He had no reason to be as happy doing what he was doing as he was, but he loved it. I wanted to love something. I wanted to love what I did that much. So I decided instead of doing the science teaching thing or being a high school science teacher, I wanted to be a grad student. And so I took the GREs, I applied to the schools and I ended up moving, or excuse me, getting accepted to a place in Tennessee. So I packed up my life. I moved from Pennsylvania to the South and I did well in grad school. I have to say, I, I, I got published and I did good experiments and I got a handful of grants and, and I, I, did, I did well and I did really enjoy it. But something was missing. I didn't know what happened to my science after it was done. I'd put it in a manuscript or give it at a conference and then it was poof, gone and then start over. And I wanted to know what, maybe not the impact I was having, but what we could do with science. And so I moved to Washington DC after getting my PhD and was in a relatively prestigious fellowship in science policy. And I moved on to another one, uh, doing kind of science outreach work, really trying to figure out what was going on. But for all the success, I was then promptly unemployed because I wasn't as, I guess, important as I thought I was. Um, and it's something they don't teach you in grad school. It's about unemployment. Um, but from that, I ended up applying to a ton of positions. And I came across this position one day, it was called Sharing Science Specialist at the American Geophysical Union. I'm an ecologist, I've never heard of AGU before. But sharing science, I like to share my science. And sure, I can be special at sharing my science. And so I, I went out on a limb and I applied to this job and I'm happy I did because five plus years later, I'm out here talking to all of you and I wouldn't have it any other way. 
And so this is a science story. It might not seem like it. I didn't talk about my research. I didn't talk about any type of, um, like I studied frogs. I didn't talk about frogs or disease or, or pesticides or toxicology or any of that stuff, which is what I did my research on. But it's about me, it's about my journey. It's about what science did for me and how I found that balance between the personal and the professional. And that's what we're going to be getting into today. And I'll, I'll leave it to Olivia to talk about why is the personal so powerful? How can it be powerful? Thanks. And thanks for that story, Shane. Although I will say teachers can also be very poor and happy, but leaving that aside. Um, so yeah, Shane's going to talk also about how the personal can be powerful in stories. But I really love this quote from Ursula Le Guin, uh, the great writer, because she talks about how through art, through stories, we can have our experience spoken and articulated. And she says, you know, it's one of the reasons why we read poetry, because poets can give us the words we need. When we read good poetry, we often say, yeah, that's it. That's how I feel. And she says that Storytelling is a tool for knowing who we are and what we want. If we never find our experience described, we assume that our experience is insignificant. And, and I think this, yeah, go ahead, Shane. I was just gonna say, I love that. And and I, I, I appreciate Olivia. Olivia is um, a voracious reader. And so I'm like, Olivia, we need a quote for this. She said, I'm on it, I got one. Uh, so that's, that's a, and, and this is, this is lovely. And, I want to, so we're talking about the personal and storytelling and, and why that's important, but kind of taking a broader approach to it, why should we put the personal in science? Oftentimes we're taught the exact opposite. We should not be doing that. Science should be objective. We, we shouldn't be personal in science, but there's some real important reasons to do that. I love this example. There's, so, uh, a teacher took uh, their seventh grade classroom to visit Fermilab, a, a national lab. And before visiting this lab, to just talk to the scientists, the staff at the lab, the, the teacher asked their class to draw what they think a scientist looks like. And so these are some of the examples of, of what they drew. And uh, I, I like the one in the middle, especially it's like a, like a cape, almost like a magician, but not all, but most of them were of old white men in lab coats, the very stereotypical image of what a scientist looks like. But after they visited Fermilab and they got to talk to and interact with real scientists, same students drew these images. Because science is part of everyone, it belongs to everyone, and it's done by all sorts of different people. So if we're able to show who scientists are, then we can potentially um, allow students and next generations to have that inspiration that, hey, I can be a scientist because scientists look like me. And I can say for me personally, I am a face of science. I am not the face of science. And so that's why the personal is really important. An example from storytelling is there was uh, a, a community college professor who was interested in what uh, their students thought about science and scientists and actually had them uh, listen to science stories from the science story uh, organization, the Story Collider. These are really true, personal, sometimes really deep and emotional stories. Had them listen to these stories along with other ways of humanizing science and scientists and asked them at the beginning of the course and at the end, kind of their perceptions of scientists and what they thought about them. And there's a lot going on in this table, I understand that, but just some things to note that when they asked them some common descriptors of a scientist before uh, going through this course, they say that scientists are curious, uh, that they're Albert Einstein, especially intelligent, and yes, these might be true, but they're not universal truths by any means, and not everyone is obviously Einstein. But at the end of the course, and then six months later, they asked them again, and they said that scientists can be all types of people, and they're not just one person. And so they were able to show in a relatively short period of time that science 
belongs to everyone, that all sorts of folks can be science. And so while I understand that some of these aren't storytelling examples per se, this is why it's important to put the personal in there. And so we use stories in particular, though, to humanize, to personalize, and to um, make these kind of memorable connections in science or otherwise. But kind of sticking with this theme of the sciences, there's two studies that have been done that are just fascinating and also uh, maybe depressingly informative. Uh, so this first study in uh, 2007 by Fisk et al. asked people, just people, non-scientists, scientists otherwise, what they thought of certain characteristics uh, and whether they would view a characteristic as, um, broadly speaking, competent and incompetent, warm and cold. And uh, specifically with scientific characteristics, were viewed as competent, good, intellectual, but not necessarily warm or cold, just kind of meh. Well, follow that through to ask specifically about professions, right? Asking them about, uh, well, you can see on here a whole slew of different professions. And it, it followed with scientists as well. Now, I will note that in this depiction, there are engineers, researchers, doctors, teachers, professors, who are all also scientists in some capacity or can be, and I get that. But for the purposes of this study, they pulled out that it's scientists. And again, really competent, but not really warm or cold, right? But if you look and see nurse, teacher, doctor, professor, they're in this quadrant that we really want to be in because these are more oftentimes seen as trusted messengers, as trusted resources, because they have that warmth. And so through storytelling might be one way to kind of bump the, again, for these purposes, generic scientist moniker, up into that quadrant. And just another example, uh, so this study from 2016, same idea. So scientists are viewed as trusted, but, and I love this, inhuman, basically emotionless. And you can read this here, but so there's about 2,000 participants uh, in this study. They found the scientists regarded as trustworthy and scrupulous, but not necessarily just a regular person, uh, or sorry, more so than a regular person, again, language aside, but also more robot-like and more goal-oriented but cold and more interested in do the pursuit of knowledge than doing the right thing. All those things go together. They, they don't have to be exclusive. They're oftentimes not exclusive, but sometimes they might be seen as exclusive. So storytelling is not the answer, but it can be an answer to kind of uh, inject more of the personal into this. And so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Olivia to kind of talk more about this. Yeah. So, you know, there's this great quote from Drew Lanham, who's a, an ecologist and ornithologist and who wrote this fantastic memoir, The Home Place, who talks about how scientists have done a poor job of, of reaching people who are not also scientists um, about things that really matter to everyone and have significance for everyone. He says, you know, we, we put all of this multidimensional uh, information into obscure tomes. These tomes are important, but the sin is in leaving the words to die there, pressed between the pages. As knowledge molders in the stacks, the public goes on largely uninformed about the wild beings and places that should matter to all of us. And I love this phrase, science's tendency to make the miraculous mundane is like replacing the richest artistry with paint by number portraits. So a really great argument for why personalizing um, makes things much more captivating and actually allows us to connect with more people. And you can see lots of evidence of this with journalism around science. Um, so first of all, wombat poop, who doesn't think that that's goofy and funny and interesting, right? Especially since they create cube shaped feces. It's just so weird. But journalists are also really good at making a story interesting and the science interesting by bringing up the feelings of the researchers involved. So I love this quote, we opened those intestines up like it was Christmas, says one of the co-authors. <laughs> I 
I find this hilarious every time I read it. But you know, that's that passion for being able to explore an exciting topic that is not always well conveyed to people who aren't in doing the science. And I also love this quote, if, if you really want people to think differently or even act differently based on the kind of science that you do and what you know, stories are a great way to do this because as Philip Pullman says, stories are not arguments. They set out not to convince, but to beguile. And there is something so seductive, isn't there, about a compelling story in a way that any kind of, that, that just isn't there with a debate. And just from a more kind of um, personal interest perspective, everybody should be able to tell good stories because it's good for your career. Uh, whether you want to be a better teacher, I think we all know teachers who really inspired us because of the stories they told and we remember the, the elements of science that they told us about in a storytelling mode. Certainly I remember the story about Edward Jenner seeing that milkmaids were not getting smallpox and learning from that that cowpox, you know, which was like smallpox but less uh, uh, aggressive, could then be used so that people wouldn't get infected with smallpox. This sort of wonderful way that discoveries are made. When you present things, whether it's to a department, whether it's at a conference, the more that you can incorporate at least elements of storytelling or in the introduction telling a bit of a personal story, the more your audience will appreciate what you're saying. And in, in job interviews, certainly outside of academia, that's almost entirely being able to tell stories because you're going to be asked again and again, give me an example of when, whatever. So the better stories that you can tell about an example of an accomplishment you've done, some conflict you've negotiated, an obstacle you've overcome, the better it's going to be to demonstrate your capabilities. And Shane? So we've uh, been talking about um, kind of these examples of why you should use storytelling. And I just want to add, especially from that, um, like in the classroom perspective. So going back farther before uh, undergrad for me, I had an AP bio teacher who told us about the voyage of the HMS Beagle for Darwin and, and his voyage to the Galapagos Islands. And that's why I'm doing what I like that's that set the whole thing off that I was so fascinated by that because he told such a compelling story about it that I ended up going to, for my undergrad uh, was in like my degree is in ecology and evolution because of him because of the stories he told so just like wanted to throw that out there and before we kind of uh, get into the mechanics of uh, how to insert the personal into the story i want to ask you all another question so for this one uh, we said how willing are you i just want to know have you ever have folks ever uh, used personal stories or details when talking specifically about your science or research or frankly someone else's if you're telling a story of a colleague or a famous scientist or whatever it might be so just give us a quick uh, spot check here All right, most folks have voted. If you haven't, I'll give you all a few more seconds. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, great, so most of you have. That's fantastic. Uh, so if you're already doing this, awesome. If you're not, that's okay too. There's, like, that's, why we're all here today. Uh, so if you haven't, we encourage you to do so, and we're hopefully providing some ways to do that. If you have already, hopefully some of this uh, that we're gonna be talking about and that we are talking about just gives you even more reinforcement and potentially some hard skills in, in how to do this type of thing. So getting kind of the mechanics of things, in any good story, there is or are people or some sort of personal interest, something for your audience or an audience to care about. In the, well, frankly, in these times, someone who does this so incredibly well is Ed Young, who is a reporter at The Atlantic. He's an author, but he's really been diving into over the past year, stories about COVID and not just 
the COVID is is obviously the 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 death toll and how terrible it is, but really personal human stories, the kind of untold stories of how it's affecting people in their everyday lives, the things that might not necessarily get covered in the news, or going beyond just the sheer numbers and and really getting personal and it's it's deep heavy stuff i mean for me personally frankly some of it is difficult to read but it's also providing a voice that i don't think there's a lot of great people doing reporting out there right now um, but ed really stands out at least for me personally who's able to just make things so like i just i just empathize and, and sympathize with folks so much there's also in any good story, there's suspense and tension and mystery and intrigue. Basically that idea of like what happens next. There's a reason why there's the the saying like the, the book, you, you can't put a good book down. Um, it's literally, I've been there. I've been reading a book and I can't, I, I, I need to know what happens next. I need to know where this is going. So turns out it's, it's two in the morning and I'm still reading a book I've been reading for the past few hours. Someone who did this well from the science world was Rachel Carson, uh, if you're unfamiliar. She was an ecologist uh, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency, and uh, she was perhaps most well-known for writing Silent Spring, and Silent Spring is a book about uh, pesticides, specifically the pesticide DDT, and essentially how terrible it was slash is uh, for the environment. But Rachel Carson, when she wrote Silent Spring, she didn't write it like a manuscript. She didn't start off Silent Spring with, um, I really, I forget what DDT is every time, but it's something like diphenyl, diethyl, triethyl, something like that. But DDT is an organochloride pesticide that's been linked to deleterious non-target effects in wildlife. She didn't start like that. Instead, she started like this, with a fable for tomorrow. There once was a town in the heart of America where all life seemed at harmony with its surroundings, but then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. It was like some evil spell settled over the community. Mysterious maladies swept over flocks of chickens, the cattle and sheep, they sickened and died. The farmers spoke of much illness among their families. Children would be stricken suddenly at play and die within a few hours. I've read this literally hundreds of times by now. And every single time I think, what was it? Wait, what, what's happening? Because it was just so compelling that when I read this, I can't not ask that question knowing what the answer is. And this is this is a great example of how to uh, reel in an audience with these with this suspense and, and tension. And any good story has compelling vivid sensory details. Uh, Basically, anything in your senses, you can feel, taste, smell, touch, whatever, as if it's happening to you. Someone who does this well, and you can you can like them or not, but Stephen King, uh, specifically pulling from It. So if you've seen the movie, you're probably going to be all visualizing something very, well, visualizing the same thing. Uh, and even if you, you have, and you've also read the book, but I'm thinking from the book, because I've actually never seen the movie, and I'm, it's almost intentional at this point but he was wearing a baggy suit with great big orange buttons a bright tie electric blue flopped down his front or the thing in the drain crooned in a clotted chuckling voice it held george's arm in its thick and wormy grip so regardless of whether we've seen how this has been portrayed on screen or if we've just read it or you're just reading it here for the first time we're all probably picturing something and we might not be picturing the same thing, but we're going through the same experience. And that's the important thing, because even though the imagery might not be the same, the experience and, and like what's happening to us is the same, or at least very similar. And a good story can do that. And so when we talk about stories, we like to talk about the bones, the meat, and then the ornaments. Like what makes a story special? What makes a story personal? And the good news is that we've given you kind of famous examples and books and that type of thing. And we are gonna be talking more about some really great examples from literature and other types of uh, media and mediums, but you don't have to be Stephen King to tell a good story. You don't have to be famous writer, or, uh, videographer, or whoever to tell a good story. There are small things that folks can do to make any sort of communication more compelling. And so some examples that we know of and we've heard from scientists 
10 years ago, the Arctic was whispering, but now it's screaming. This was from a scientist talking about climate change and specifically its effect on the Arctic. This is this is such a great uh, um, visual, even though it's, like, it's literally not happening, but it's, it elicits a response in folks. The violent collision shoots jets of radioactive matter into space as though someone had smashed their palm in a tube of toothpaste with holes at both ends. This is how uh, the discovery of gravitational waves was described. And granted, I've never cut the opening on a tooth on the other end of a toothpaste and smashed my hand down on it. But I have an idea of what that might look like. And if you look at artist renderings of gravitational waves, that's what it looks like. Or maybe even just trying to transport someone into a story to get them in a storyteller's shoes or in the scene. Talking about scale, well, this this instrument I use on on uh, the moon, it's about the size of a small juice box. These are small things, no pun intended, but they can make a big difference. And so I'm gonna kick it back over to Olivia to provide some more examples. Yeah, thanks, Shane. So these are just some more way examples of how science and storytelling can be interwoven. Uh, and I'm using you know, books or full-length movies just because they may be something you're more familiar with. But these, again, as we've said before, stories can be much shorter too and have the same impact. So in My Octopus Teacher, this documentary, you know, it's about a man who's really become disaffected with his life, with his work, even with his family. But through meeting and getting to know this octopus, both learning about her and her behavior and forming this bond with her, it also helps him rediscover his love of his profession, and reconnect with his own family. In H's for Hawk, Helen MacDonald writes this whole story about uh, hawks and falconry, but it's also about how she took on the raising and, and um, bonding with the hawk to get over grief over the loss of her father. The sound of a wild snail eating, the author uh, suffered this awful illness where she was in terrible pain and, and any movement was almost impossible. So for a year, as she lay almost still constantly, her only permanent companion was this uh, land snail in a terrarium. And so she sort of exists in this slow time with the snail, studying it, learning about it, and sort of contemplating life through this. You can also have uh, storytelling as memoir with science, sort of that interweaving, like the home place, which I quoted before, uh, a place between the tides is about the salt marsh, but it sort of follows a year. And so it's both about the marsh changing over that time and the person's life. John Steinbeck was an uh, enthusiastic amateur marine biologist. He went with Ed Ricketts on this great collecting trip uh, and tells some great stories. This is how I know that Sally Lightfoot crabs are really, really fast because he has a vendetta against them because they're so hard to collect. My Family and Other Animals is this great story by Gerald Durrell, you may be familiar with, where he mixes this, um, when he was a, about a 10-year-old with his whole family living in Corfu, the island in Greece, and uh, was an avid animal, uh, a naturalist and uh, collector of animals. And he talks about, um, among other things, loving these scorpions that would live in the walls, uh, the stone walls outside, and how you could see them looking like polished chocolate he says, then one day I found a fat female scorpion in the wall, wearing what at first glance appeared to be a pale fawn fur coat. Closer inspection proved that the strange garment was made up of a mass of tiny babies clinging to the mother's back. I was enraptured by this family, and I made up my mind to smuggle them into the house and up to my bedroom so I might keep them and watch them grow up. So he eases them into a matchbox, comes inside, Fortunately, it's right around lunchtime, so he leaves it on a mantle while he goes to eat lunch. And as you can imagine, after lunch, uh, one of his elder brothers wants a cigarette, and uh, hilarity ensues. So there's this great mixture of personal family stories with this animal behavior. You can also just interweave the personal and the scientific. So Robin Wall Kimmerer in this magnificent book, Breeding Sweetgrass, a collection of essays where she both tells stories that are from various indigenous groups around um, plant life and sort of our relationship with the earth. Her own stories as a plant biologist and um, as a person who loves nature and interweaving those in, in an incredibly beautiful and vivid way. Or The Soul of an Octopus by Cy Montgomery. I'll read a very quick quote. She's looking right at you, Scott says. 
As I hold her glittering gaze, I instinctively reach to touch her head. As supple as leather, as tough as steel, as cold as night, Victor Hugo wrote of octopus's flesh. But to my surprise, her head is silky and softer than custard. As I stroke her with my fingertips, her skin goes white beneath my touch. White is the color of a relaxed octopus. In cuttlefish, close relatives, females turn white when they encounter a fellow female, someone whom they need not fight or flee. And she also says, to share such a moment of deep tranquility with another being, especially one as different from us as the octopus, is a humbling privilege. So this combination of the facts with these vivid descriptions with that emotional connection. And finally, just one more example from this uh, mass of them that we've collected here. I just, I love Oliver Sacks anyway, but his love for ferns is just so touching. Ferns delighted me with their curly cues, their croziers, the Victorian quality, not unlike the frilled antimacassars and lacy curtains in our house. But at a deeper level, they filled me with wonder because they were of such ancient origin. All the coal that heated our home, my mother told me, was essentially composed of ferns or other primitive plants. Ferns had survived with little change for a third of a billion years. Other creatures like dinosaurs had come and gone, but ferns seemingly so frail had survived all the vicissitudes the earth had known. My sense of a prehistoric world of immense spans of time was first stimulated by ferns and fossil ferns. And he also, uh, I think rather sweetly, talks about uh, how he likes the scentless green world of ferns, an ancient world before the coming of flowers. He says, a world too with a charming modesty where reproductive organs, stamens and pistils are not thrust out flamboyantly, but concealed with a certain delicacy on the undersides of leafy fronds. These are just great ways that we learn about science and people all at once in a very memorable way. And I wanna emphasize that if you don't feel comfortable or you don't have a personal story about whatever you wanna talk about, you don't have to. A lot of science writers, like Deborah Blum here, talks about the story of a chemist who is doing certain kinds of work. So it's about the person as well as the science. Or in Napoleon's Buttons, the whole framework is about historical figures and situations and how molecules affected them. So you can talk either in a historical context or maybe there's someone you know, or maybe you're even appealing to your audience to bring in the personal. Like maybe you start by saying, what are your experiences with wildfires? Does anyone have a story of how this has affected your life? There are other ways to bring that in, even if you don't feel comfortable bringing in from your own life. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate that. I think it's really important because folks might say, I don't have a story. And one, I, I personally don't think that's true. Uh, but two, maybe it's not the moment to be telling something that's about yourself. Uh, in the last webinar, I told a story about a, um, a herpetologist, a frog researcher that I knew who basically had their career change because of this discovery they made. And that's still a compelling personal story, even the person was about you. So I think I'm just emphasizing that because that's really important uh, to think about. Personal doesn't have to be your personal. It could be. It should be, but it doesn't have to be, depending on the context. Some other things to keep in mind about kind of setting the scene for this uh, uh, to keep things personal, um, or just frankly for any good story, is when you're telling a story about you or otherwise, uh, it's really important to get out there to let folks who are listening, viewing, whatever, know where you're going with it. A great example that I like is from Hidden Figures. Uh, I'm talking about the movie, I've never read the book, so if it's different, apologies. But in the movie, the it starts off with this scene where uh, three African-American women are on the side of the road, their car's broken down. You can kind of tell just from uh, like the, the car itself that we're somewhere maybe like 50s, 60s. All of a sudden, a white male police officer comes up pulls up and it's very combative and confrontational um, and very accusatory. What are you doing? What's going on? Et cetera, et cetera. For, I would say, no reason. The reason is uh, is racism and, and a whole slew of really complicated, terrible reasons. But there's no inciting incident, essentially. And they say, oh, we just broken down. We need to get to work, though. 
it's really important that we're not late because we work for NASA. And the situation immediately changes and the demeanor specifically of the police officer changes. And it goes from him being very uh, accusatory and, and this being a very tense scene to him giving them a police escort to NASA headquarters. This is in uh, Southern Virginia at the time, because at that time, NASA was one of the most important things going on in uh, in the States. This is the first five minutes of this movie. And this tells you so much about what is going on at the time, uh, what relations between people are like, what's important in the country, what's important in the world. And so I think it's such a great example of scene setting. Something else to keep in mind, not unique to science, but kind of specific to science, uh, is to have an ending with your story. I feel like with science, and this is just the nature, but we get to the end of whatever we're talking about and go, oh, there's so much else we don't know. And that is fact, because if we answered all the questions, there would be no more science. We're never gonna answer all the questions. That's kind of the point. Research leads to answers, but also leads to more questions, and that's fine. But sometimes it's just as simple as putting a period at the end of the sentence, a full stop. If you're talking, taking a breath, and it can be, so this is what we found, and this is what we this is why it matters. From that, we're gonna do thing X, Y, or Z. And just even that breath can make so much of a difference because people want finality. They want a uh, they want like they want that full stop, they want that resolution before you move on to something else. So just kind of keep that in mind. And I kind of want to just round this out with just some, some things about stories in general. And so, okay, so we've talked about uh, why you should tell stories, some of the mechanics behind storytelling, some really great examples, which we will provide to you in a list uh, when we follow up via email, because there's a lot I know. But we often get the question, okay, well, where am I telling stories though? And the short answer is everywhere. Uh, we are already telling stories every single day and every time we communicate, there's probably some elements of stories in there. But just from a functional standpoint, I mean, Olivia talked about some of these more practical examples, right? In the classroom, at conferences or talks, in uh, interviews, but also there could be formal places to tell stories, whether that's uh, like through a storytelling organization or, or something like that. You could tell stories to get a point across, to be persuasive. Uh, maybe that's for trying to talk to policymakers about your science. They love stories. You can tell stories just in your everyday life and you're already doing this to friends, families, maybe it's peers or coworkers. I mean, there is no kind of, there's no place that isn't right for storytelling. And I guarantee you, you're already doing it. And it does seem like, at least from our spot, uh, surveys that you're already doing it and that's great we encourage you to keep doing it and if you're not already doing it get out there and start telling stories Shh, can i do this am i a good storyteller and the short answer is yes storytelling like anything takes practice but the great thing like i said is that many of us are already doing it and so you can and you are a storyteller you don't have to be a professional storyteller to tell stories that's not exactly what it is and i'll let uh olivia kind of follow up with this yeah just a few tips to think about as you think well how could i talk about this how could i bring in those details well remember what we talked about how do you feel how did you feel when you first either saw something in the in the world, some kind of phenomenon that made you ask a question, or you were reading the literature and you asked a question that led to your most recent research. Were you baffled? Were you intrigued? Were you fascinated? Were you so perplexed that it kept you up at night? How did you feel as you were conducting your research? For me, this was often a feeling of exasperation because my snails seemed to sabotage my experiments left and right. Um, but you know, how do you how do you feel once you've found something and once some of your research is concluded? Are you elated? Are you over the moon? Are you blown away because of what the implications suggest? And then, um, just in terms of those vivid details, the sensory element, what are you seeing, smelling, hearing, touching? Say in your lab, are there sounds of mach machinery or equipment? Is there a particular smell from uh, some kind of chemical that you're using? Is there conversation going on? Is it something silly? Like uh, in the lab I used to be in, they had put in 
motion sensors. So we'd have to get up periodically from the bench where we were working and wave our arms around to turn the lights back on. You know, what about at your research site? Is it like the salty, bracing tang of sea air? Or are you going to exposed mud flats where there's that kind of thick sulfuric stench and the squelching sound as your hip waders, you know, press against that surface? What about as you work on your data? Has the world narrowed to your screen, its glow casting a ghostly light over your room? Do you hear vaguely from your open window the sounds of spring drifting tantalizingly in on a soft breeze? Do you smell the life-giving scent of coffee, the only thing reviving you as you work, you know, your fingers tapping uh, on the keys? You can tell these stories. And one other thing folks ask, well, uh, does my story matter? Is my story big enough? Are the stakes high enough? Because going back to this uh, kind of structure of a story, the climax is the big aha moment of any story. And it's, yeah, like the dragon is slain, the mystery solved, et cetera. But maybe some of us feel like, oh, maybe our climax is just kind of meh. It's about what it means to you. If you make, if, if something really matters to you, if it was a big deal to you, and you can convey it in a way that shows that it matters to you, it will matter to others. So don't worry about, oh, okay, will anyone care about this? If you care about this, others will care about it. And lastly, I think it, there's a question of should you do it? And surprise, like everything else, the answer is yes, you most certainly should. Livia? Yeah, so in case you're worried you know, will my bringing in the personal harm my credibility with non-scientists about my, my, you know, my scientific credibility, essentially? No, it really won't. And there is research out there just from last year uh, demonstrating that. So some researchers were curious about whether um, if people were presented with scientific information given by an imaginary scientist who either told a personal story about why they got interested in the research or didn't include anything personal and just jumped into it, what they found was that um, people were more receptive when there was that personal story, that they actually felt that the credibility increased rather than decreased. And part of that is what Shane was saying, you know, we're all telling stories all the time. And if you're not telling the story of how you got into the science or why it matters to you or why you're doing it, people may come up with their own stories and their own idea of your agenda for it. And this was something non-controversial, this was plant science. So even there, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to bring in the personal, it actually helps. And so there are a ton of examples of how to do this. Uh, some we're just going to highlight are, we have a couple podcasts here at AGU. So Third Pod from the Sun and Scientel with really in different ways, but dive into that personal, especially Scientel of the stuff that's not uh, in, in scientific manuscripts or, or in a lecture. I mentioned the story collider earlier. These are all personal firsthand stories about science from scientists and non-scientists. And then the moth is just storytelling full stop, no science or otherwise, but really great stories. And all of these are available in podcast form. So what's next? We've kind of blew through this and we've actually gone a smidge longer than we usually do because we're very passionate about this and very excited. But your storytelling journey does not end here. We have uh, a series, a whole series laid out. We have a half dozen more webinars we're doing this year. Uh, we will provide information in the follow-up email to all of you on how to register for these. I think the first few are live and we'll keep adding as we go along. Uh, you can follow us on the social medias. I'm actually gonna come back to this slide while we answer some questions. The last thing is, if you are interested in science communication, storytelling, or otherwise, please think about joining the Sharing Science community where we provide not only tips and tools and resources and that type of thing, but it's really a community where people can get together to talk. And so with that, I'm going to go back, leave this one up, and I think we will answer some questions. which it just so happens I haven't been looking at until we got to this yeah. moment. We have some great ones. Um, one that maybe we can cover a little more quickly is, um, so 
I've heard you and many others over the years assert that all stories have a common form, the story arc, but it's always just been an assertion. Is there any actual research that would prove to us that assertion is true? Well, so it is true that not all stories follow the same kind of arc. Um, this is one that particularly within our kind of, you know, Western from European culture tends to map up very well. But this was something that Freytag came up with in the 19th century. And it just happens that you can map stories onto it very well. So the evidence is in the fact that you can map it, but it is a theoretical framework. It's not a uh, hypothesis or scientific theory saying these are the taxonomic parts. So they, they don't have to do that, but it does help, I think, as you're thinking about stories to think about where the narrative tension increases and decreases and which elements are going to bring people in and sort of um, satisfy the narrative tension and the need for change that people tend to expect with stories. Yeah, that's a great point. A uh, few folks asking about different links to some of the resources we shared. Uh, we will, like I said, we'll follow up probably next week at the latest. Um, so we'll definitely make sure we provide those. Uh, and a couple questions about video and specifically TikTok. Uh, we, we've done things about that before. I do science communication via TikTok. You're right, it's anywhere like 15 seconds to a minute. That's a whole different monster. Uh, but we do have some uh, information on that as well. Um, so one asking if there's going to be a different reception for stories if a man or woman is telling it. And that's a great question. Um, I think it's going to really depend on the audience to some degree, what, what, whether there's going to be a different reception there. Shane, I don't know if there's anything from the Story Collider work that you do that you want to bring up there. I mean, I think it's not necessarily. I think it's just it's it's about knowing your audience. Um, and some audiences are going to be more receptive to certain people than others. And so I don't want to make kind of like blanket statements, but to the best of your abilities, and again, there's not, you can't always tell, uh, but kind of knowing who you're talking to. And if you don't, trying to make things, I guess, as I'm going to say generically engaging, and I don't mean that in any certain way. But yeah, I think storytelling is no different than any other sort of communication in that if you know to the best of your abilities who you're talking to, you can frame your story in a way that will resonate with them um, in the best way possible. Yeah, and beyond that, you know, patriarchy. So yes, there there may well be differences that are hard to avoid, but it it, it is a very good question. Um, I see one, what's, if your goal is to teach something as opposed to just share information. Um, and yeah, I do think it, it is much the same because often, the elements that you want to have uh, whoever you're teaching remember most are the ones that you can convey very well through storytelling and the ones that will stay in their mind more. Another great thing though with the teaching element is to then have those you're teaching also tell stories around the material because that's an even better way of really like getting people to internalize the material. Uh, Shane, I see one. How do we make sure we separate storytelling from fake news? Do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, there's, there's a couple in here about kind of um, like fake news or uh, skepticism or that type of thing. So everyone uses stories. Um, and actually some of the folks out there who are most successful about spreading misinformation or intentional disinformation are fantastic storytellers. And that's just, that's a consequence. That's a fact of life. The only thing that I would say, and we say this with all, all of our communication, uh, but storytelling is a great example of this, is that if there are more people out there communicating truth and using stories to communicate truth, then there are more, there's a higher likelihood that those folks will be, um, will be listened to, that the barriers to entry will be reduced, that there'll be more trusted messengers out there. So we're not going to be able to stop the people who are using, who are very good communicators and are using that as a weapon, but we can get more folks out there who are using it, uh, who are communicating in a way that is spreading more, um, more facts, more knowledge, and storytelling is a great way to relate to people so that you're not only just providing information. We know that that one-way communication doesn't work, 
but you are forming relationships with people and that's really what helps to get an effective message across so it's not all doom and gloom uh there there's there is some good news out there and that's why we encourage folks to do this type of stuff um because there's there's science behind it that shows that people will relate to you more and the more people we have doing this the better i think the um the spread of true, factual, important information will be. Um, so there's some questions about, I'm going to kind of round this up, and this might be one of the, the last ones we do, but kind of about uh, exper like explaining uh, like hard science or experiments or um, using stories in that type of way. And one thing we didn't explicitly say, but Specifically, when talking about research, um, maybe you're talking about an experiment you did, or a time in the field, or your lab work, or whatever it might be. And you really you want to tell a story about results. It's not necessarily uh, it's not solely to be about the personal. You want to mix this in or use a story that way. Stories can be part of your communication message. They don't have to be the communication message. So if you are giving a 15 minute lecture at a conference, maybe the first few minutes is something like what I did with that story, that quick story I told. Maybe the point of the story is to reel your audience in and then to really get into the hard science, really get into the more technical components of what you're talking about. And your story can include elements of your science, of your research, of whatever it might be, or maybe it doesn't even have to. Maybe it's just to kind of set the scene or to bring your audience in to sometimes wake them up from the slew of other presentations they were listening to. So stories don't have to be an all or nothing approach and they rarely are. Uh, they, they can be a really great way to get folks engaged, to relate to them, to get them listening. And then you have the opportunity to get into more technical things that might not be conducive to storytelling, but are important all the same. Um, and I saw, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say uh, one thing, actually, I realized I forgot to do, and there are still many of you here. So if you would please, 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 uh, we have one last poll for you. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm going to put this up real quick. I forgot uh, to, Shane. Yeah, so we'll answer a question while this is up here. Um, but just, it's the same question at the very beginning. Just please, please, please let us know uh, how you feel now. And Olivia, I think you had one last one we could end with. Yeah, I noticed a question around um, the structure of writing. If you're not writing for a journal paper, the question was, if you want to maintain narrative suspense, do you hold off on talking about the hypothesis until very late into the story? Um, or you know what you found and you can certainly if, if it's sort of the idea of a mystery but you don't always have to i mean you can see in news articles or even news features often they lead with what was found but they're still telling that story to get to how it was found so that we're still interested and excited even if we maybe already know the you know answer at this point um, so it doesn't have to be sort of an either or or you have to conceal what you've um what you've discovered and what you've been asking about until the very end. Great, yeah, I have. That's that's a fantastic point. I have nothing more to add. I just wanted to end by throwing up the results here. So y'all were very already very willing to use stories. Uh, that's ticked up a little bit. I very much appreciate that. That's our time. I just want to thank all of you for being here. If we didn't answer your question, we'll try to get to it in the follow up. And then um, there are many ways you can reach out to us directly or through social media, whatever it might be, and many more opportunities to learn about stories. So if you liked this or you thought we were missing something, please let us know or uh, get a hold of us. And we hope to see you, well, I guess, see your names again at a webinar in the future. So thank you all so Thanks much. For joining.